On February 14th, he survived the deadliest school massacre in American history. Since then, he and other survivors of Parkland, Florida, have used their voices to stand up against gun violence. Please welcome March for Our Lives co-founder and activist David Hogg. Hi, David. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Thank you, we have seen what you've gone through with your classmates. We've seen you on TV. We've seen you challenge Marco Rubio. Mm -hmm. How have you had the courage to do what you're doing? We have to develop this courage when our political leaders refuse to have it. You know, when, when politicians say now is not the time to talk about this, they're right. The time to talk about this was decades and centuries ago when we should have. I want to go back to that day. How much of that day still plays in your head? February 14th, where were you in the school when the shots rang out? Yeah, I was in a building right next to where the shooting had occurred at the time. Uh, I left the building where I was in uh, because we thought it was a drill, and we also thought it was a fire drill at the same time. There were several gunshots that I heard going into my uh, classroom, but sadly because uh, mass shootings are so common in the United States, a yeah. lot of students go through active shooter drills at school, yeah. um, and that's what I initially thought it was when I was there. When did and you know it was real? When I saw, when, I, when my friends were on Twitter and saw there was a, an active shooter at Stoneman Douglas High School. And during that time, that's when I decided to start interviewing people when I was in that uh, classroom, not knowing where the shooter was at, t at the time, if there was just one or multiple, uh, not knowing whether or not we were gonna die. Because I figured, you know, if, if we died in that classroom, Hopefully, our, if our souls were left behind, hopefully our voices could carry on and create some kind of change. But I was lucky enough to make it out that day, so I have to make that change for the 17 others that couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. How traumatic has it been since? I mean, it was like you guys were kind of in the spotlight right after. Did you have time to grieve, and have you taken that time to yourself that you've needed? I think uh, the way that I've gone about coping with it and taking that time for myself is by surrounding myself with People don't say this often, like when they're like when they've seen gun violence, but people that have witnessed gun violence are all part of a horrible club that none of us want to be part of. Mm -hmm. And my mission is to make sure that club doesn't grow anymore. And that should be every elected official's position as well, because gun violence is a public health issue. It is not a partisan issue. Children dying on our streets and in our schools and in our communities every day should not and is not a partisan issue. In the same way that car man, like when people were advocating to make cars safer, mm -hmm. they weren't anti-car or pro-car. I'm not pro-Second Amendment or anti-Second Amendment. I'm pro-kids not dying. Right. right. What has been the most rewarding and also the most frustrating about your activism? Uh, the most rewarding part has been seeing the amazing people. Like when we started a 63 day bus tour around the country, we started with the uh, the Peace March. Yeah, right here in Chicago. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Father uh, Flagler's Church. From Father Flagler's Church, mm -hmm. amazing church yeah. at St. Yeah. Sabina. And we did that Peace March. And that was incredible because we brought four uh, youth activists on us with the road to change for two months across the country. And that was really rewarding. But the most disturbing part is that people think that we can. When people talk about gun violence in the media, oftentimes they only talk about one type of gun violence, and that's gun violence that affects primarily white communities. Right. And that's not okay, because this has to be an intersectional movement that involves everybody, because in the same way that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere, we have to solve, just, uh, we have to solve gun violence and violence in general everywhere to actually end it, right? Mm -hmm. And we can't neglect any community in that discussion. Right. Right. The video of you standing up to Marco Rubio, uh, what was the reaction that you got? Well, that was actually my friend Cameron. Oh, that was, uh, that was not you. That was Cameron that spoke yeah. up. Yeah. OK. Um, but I was incredibly proud of him mm -hmm. when he went up there. And uh, I had actually taken three flights that day because I was in LA. I had to fly from LA to somewhere else, to Tallahassee, um, to lobby for that, the law that we passed, and then back down to Florida. And sadly, I couldn't make it on the town hall. But I was incredibly proud of our team for standing up and pointing out um, the BS that was there. Right. right. You're right. in town for the Chicago Ideas Week, and you're going to yes. be talking tonight. What's the main point you want folks to get from your talk? Your zip code should not determine the validity of your argument when it comes to arguing about gun violence. Mm. Right. And it, I hope that people realize that gun violence doesn't just affect one community. It affects the American, not just the American community or any single community. It affects the human community of this planet. And we have to work together to solve it as humanity. Are you hopeful that we will? I know we will. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with you in charge, perhaps we will. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining us, David. And you can hear David tonight at the Harris Theater. Tickets are still available. Make sure you go check him out.